Welcome to this week's edition of Rocket Rounds. My name is Dr. Chris Martin, and I'm happy to have with me today Dr. Anna Agrick. Dr. Agrick is a wonderful general surgeon, brilliant intensivist, but what you may not know is that she's been heavily involved in international medicine. So I'd like to welcome Anna. Thank you, Chris. Pleasure to be here. Well, thanks so much for coming. Um, you know, I want to get into, you know, how did you get involved in, in the international medicine? Well, this process has been going on for about 15 years now. Um, I always knew this is something I'd want to pursue, and I've been interested in this basically the first day of medical school. It was just a matter of finding out how to get involved. I joke around that I've been in the contemplation stage for about a decade before I first made the first trip. Okay, and when you say that, you know, since medical school, what got you initially even interested in doing this? Well, Chris, as you know, my background, I'm from Bosnia and have lived all over the world. So when I came to Canada at age 17, I knew that this was going to be a part, that travel and international work was going to always be a part of what I do. It was just a matter of figuring out how to incorporate it into my medical training. Got it, because, I mean, you're a, you're a busy doc. You did general surgery. You do intensive care. Uh, I mean, like, how you did all this training to be this amazing doc. So what extra training did you then have to do to do all these, you know, trips and medical work in, in other parts of the world? So I started off by just going to conferences and finding out as much as I could about this type of work. And I remember one of the most profound experiences was uh, actually a conference at Western where I met a psychiatrist who had essentially re revolutionized psychiatry in one in an African country. And I asked her, how do I prepare for this? And I'll never forget her words. This was about 10 years ago. She said, finish your training get excellent at what you do, and then call me. So I think it's extremely important, first off, to be an expert in your field and get comfortable with your specialty. Beyond that, uh, ever since day one, I've designed my work to fit this kind of work. So not having an elective practice, having a flexible schedule, having very supportive colleagues, such as yourself and the Department of Surgery, who allow me to take off for a month or more at a time to do this kind of work. Um, in terms of extra courses and training, uh, a course I highly recommend is a, a humanitarian skills course at Stanford that I took in 2015, which kind of gives you a taste of the skills you may need as a surgeon going into austere environments. And the rest of the training followed as I went on different trips. Each time I went, it was quite a humbling experience and I would realize, oh, I'm missing uh, X. So for example, um, encountering different diseases made me realize my knowledge of tropical medicine was quite poor. So this past year I did a three-month uh, diploma in tropical medicine in Peru. So that kind of stuff. So I think the training evolves as you gain more experience. So when you go on a, a, a trip and you work, you find a, a hole where you're like, wow, I really need to learn more about this for my next, uh, you know, um Absolutely. I'll give you an example. I've been to Haiti about three times, and the last time was uh, during the protests in, um, in 2019. I don't know if you remember. It was on television. There were violent protests mm -hmm. with lots yeah. of gunshots. So I found myself being the only surgeon in the hospital uh, and one responsible for operating with gunshot wounds, an, ex an experience I don't have a lot of here in Barrie, thankfully. Um, so that made me realize that I would really like more training in this area. That's where I, my colleagues were extremely helpful. I would call from Haiti to, for example, my vascular colleagues to ask for advice, and it prompted me to sign up for a course in England, which got canceled due to a pandemic, called uh, Surgery in Austere Environments. Oh, wow. Okay, interesting. So you mentioned Haiti. I've, I've heard about these amazing stories in Haiti. So where else have you been? And let's say, say three other places. And what, did you, what was your role there? What were you doing? Um, so Haiti it was the main one. I started off, we're very fortunate here at Barrie to have a chapter of the Team Broken Earth led by Dr. Tina Witte. So my first trip was easy in a sense because I went with a large group, about 20 very motivated individuals. So it was a organized, um, supported trip. Uh, subsequent year I returned to Haiti and then the third year our team actually went to Guatemala to provide surgical care. However, uh, I decided to continue going to Haiti and had to switch teams and went with Team Saskatoon. Uh, so Haiti is definitely one of the most, uh, uh, one of the places I've most frequently been. Uh, other than that, I mentioned Guatemala, and then last year I went to Kenya and then Guatemala. Uh, sorry, uh, Guyana as well. And when you go to these places, you say you're you're there as a surgical team. Like, are you working in a hospital? Is it a field tent? Like, what kind of environment are you finding yourself practicing in? 
Uh, hospital so far. So uh, what's nice about all of these trips we talked about is that it was in partnership with the local population, the local doctors. So in Haiti, our team would support uh, Bernard Merv's hospital in Port-au-Prince, in the capital. Um, in Kenya, I went to Mombasa to a large hospital with several hundred beds. And there I went on my own and provided education to the residents. Uh, and the same with Guyana. So a large hospital where my role was to uh, provide education. So you're working alongside with these physician, local physicians and nurses and allied health in these countries with your team, not as a freestanding unit? Yes, especially in Haiti. Uh, as I went initially as an intensivist for all three years, except I had to change roles the last year due to the uh, violent protests. But my goal has always been to work very closely with the local population and to leave something behind in terms of education. Because I think, for me personally, I think that has a higher impact than simply flying in, doing some surgeries and flying out. And what was the, the local team like? Did, were they welcoming? Did they feel like you know, they were being kind of imposed upon or did they appreciate you guys being there? I think it depends and a lot depends on you as an individual, as a team, how you approach it. I think one of the things that's extremely important uh, before you undertake this kind of work is to learn a bit about the place you're going and preferably to speak the local language, which can be challenging. I know there's many languages, but in Haiti I did all my medical work in French and I made sure um, I worked with the local doctors as much as possible, even if that meant delaying my ICU rounds for a few hours to wait for them to come so that we could do it together. Uh, and then other things that I found really important was modeling team dynamics. We had our ICU nurses with us to see how we interact with our nurses and how it's a very much a team approach and not just a physician-centered approach. So those are some of the things that I thought was, were important. And the other thing is keeping in touch. I still keep in touch with all my residents in Guyana and Kenya, as well as some people from Haiti. Uh, I think those, building those relationships um, makes you more effective when you're there and more accepted. Sometimes there would be resistance, but you have to kind of expect that and not get too bothered and work together to achieve your common goal, which is to improve healthcare in whatever place you've arrived. Well, you're, I mean, you're a wonderful teacher to the residents here. I can only imagine uh, the benefit those residents got and the physicians and the team from, from both seeing you in action, but also from the teaching you did. So uh, that's wonderful. So all these, I'm going to have to ask you, like, what the craziest story, like the most maybe good or bad thing that's happened that, that you needed to share? I think there were so many stories. I think the most dramatic story was the last trip to Haiti where um, our team essentially was sequestered inside the uh, volunteer quarters. It was too dangerous to even venture outside of our uh, quarters. And then the uh, high-level discussions uh, among the leaders of Team Broken Earth, whether we should evacuate and how we can evacuate. And so just dealing with that, and I remember talking to the head of our Team Broken Earth over the phone and saying, there's a gunshot wound in Emerge, am I safe to go see it? Um, so I, th I would say that was the craziest experience. When the protest started, the local doctors could not reach the hospital. So I became the only surgeon, uh, a general surgeon, and intensivist at the same time. So I would operate on the patient, admit them under me in the ICU, and then operate on the next one. So I would say that was probably the most intense experience that I've ever experienced. Wow. I mean, just uh, such a different and life-changing uh, thing to have happened. That's, uh, how do you think this has all changed you? I think it's definitely had an impact and I think in a lot of ways it has inspired me. It has made me a better doctor when I return home. It has made me more grateful for everything we have here. I call it my post-trip honeymoon. I would be so amazed at the cleanliness of our hospital, the amazing trained staff. Uh, I remember in Kenya uh, being on a patient ward where they had three nurses for 50 patients and they were just doing the best they could. So I think it has made me more grateful uh, to be here at RVH. It has also made me a better clinician because you learn to use your clinical skills more than extra tests. And finally, it has really inspired me. Uh, there's a couple of incredible surgeons I've met in many of these places, but I'll give you an example. Um, there's a surgeon in Kenya uh, who I became close friends with who 
has taken it upon himself, despite lack of resources, despite all the challenges to start a laparoscopic center and have himself trained by finding sponsorship, going to conferences, and then bringing that, those skills back to his hospital. Now, you know, Chris, you're involved in many initiatives here, how hard it is to get an initiative off the ground. Now, picture doing that in a place that is not supportive, that has no resources, and has higher priorities. So I think it has really inspired me to do my own part in my own hospital. If they can do it there, I think I can do it here. I, I can totally appreciate that. Uh, a couple of months I did in uh, Uganda it was a similar uh, kind of environment, and yeah, it does make you appreciate uh, what we have here and also... Yeah, it's a lot harder to get things done, so uh, that's wonderful. And so, you know, it sounds like a wonderful experience. I'll, I'll maybe not the gunshot and the, the maybe dying thing. Why don't more people do it? Why don't more physicians, nurses, and RTs and allied health go and do this kind of work? It sounds like it'd be very fulfilling and, and a great experience. I think one of the biggest barriers is simply knowing how to start. I remember when I was thinking about what kind of work I would like to do. I wasn't sure how to start. So I took a bit of a multi-pronged approach. I um, emailed a couple of people I knew who were in the field. And like I said, I was very fortunate to be invited to go with Team Broken Earth here in Barrie. So that was my start. But I think it was just a simple fact of not knowing where to start. I remember one particularly funny, in retrospect, email I wrote that said, I have all this passion. I don't know how to channel it. And the person actually wrote back and said, do you want to go to Kenya? And I said, sure, that sounds great. And that's how I ended up in Kenya um, on this teaching partnership. And like, if, so if I was looking to get involved in this, how much of a commitment, like, is, I know that Médecins Sans Frontières is usually like a three-month minimum. Like, how much time, if you want to, you know, get a feel for it, do you have to commit to really get the experience and for you know, someone to find you useful enough to come with you? It's all very, it, it depends. And one of the things I've learned over the years as I've gone to more conferences and learned the ethics behind this, uh, longer term commitments are often more rewarding and better. But I think if you wanted to experience a shorter term, there's many ways to do that. For example, one of your specialties is emergency medicine. Uh, emergency medicine does not exist as a specialty in lots of parts of the world. So a lot of academic centers are actually partnering with countries, let's say in Africa, to start programs. And they rely on volunteers to go for shorter periods of time to teach, let's say, ultrasound skills. So I think there's definitely opportunity to go on a shorter term trips, such as our Team Broken Earth was just a one week trip. But the nice thing about that is that teams would continually go throughout the year, so there was continuity of care that way. Uh, when I went to Kenya and Guyana, those were both two weeks, so those were more short-term. So there's definitely opportunity, because not everybody can take off for a period of a few months, for sure. Absolutely, or you know, be brave enough to do that, because it's a huge commitment. So it sounds like those options of going with an existing team for the short period might be a good way to get your feet wet and, and see if it's something that you'd be interested in doing. So. What does the future hold for you and your international health career? Um, we'll see. Uh, that, this pandemic has definitely changed some of my plans and canceled some of the trips. Um, so for the short term, what I've been doing is teaching residents online. As you know, education is one of my passions, and so I've been doing online exam preparation with the senior residents. Um, for the longer term, I think I would like to try a humanitarian work, so something like you mentioned, uh, Doctors Without Borders, um, but that will require a little bit more planning and stuff and a bit of a longer absence. Although as a specialist surgeon, for example, you can go for a shorter period of six weeks or so, so it's not as arduous a commitment as people think. But I think those are the two things on the horizon, and continue teaching, continue keeping in touch with the people that I've met, and... Uh, probably applying to Doctors Without Borders. Well, listen, Anna, um, I want to thank you for coming on to Rock Around today. What you're doing is wonderful, it's interesting, and inspiring to others. So keep it up, and we're very lucky to have you. If anyone has any questions or further uh, you know, inquiries about international medicine, I know Anna would be happy to chat with you. Anna, thanks again. Absolutely. Thank you, Chris. My pleasure.